Welcome to our third video in the management of ischemic strokes. In this one, we're going to talk about the evaluation of patients who present with ischemic stroke type symptoms. And you'll remember that in these stroke syndromes, we're going to be treating patients who have a blocked blood vessel here. Usually, it's a blocked blood vessel with a clot in it that is preventing blood from reaching the brain. And we want to save that ischemic penumbra. And the way we're going to get rid of this clot is through a drug called recombinant tissue plasminogen activator. Though we usually just refer to it as TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. And the way it works is it dissolves clots. It dissolves clots by uh, breaking up the fibrin in the clots. So with the clot gone, blood, blood flow is again restored and able to flow back up to the brain. So there's a very serious implication of what I just said. This medication here, it, it prevents you from forming clots. It destroys the clots that are there. And so you're going to tend to bleed a lot if you receive this medication. And sometimes that bleeding might be in the head, which could be fatal. And so this is a pretty serious medication. And there's a long history of trials that were done to try to determine which patients it was safe to give this medication to and which would benefit from it. So your history of physical and your evaluation of your patient is really to determine uh, if your stroke patient can really benefit from this safely. So the first thing you want to be sure of is that your patient is actually even having a stroke in the first place because there are several stroke mimics, things that look like a stroke but really aren't. And you don't want to be putting your patient at risk of that bleeding in the head if there, there is no chance of them getting any benefit from it. So what are some of these stroke mimics? The first is seizures, specifically something called Todd's paralysis. So after a seizure is done, a patient tends to get postictal, and there might be one area of the brain that is taking longer to recover and then the area might be imitating a stroke because function hasn't resumed there whereas it might in other places so make sure your patient is not having a seizure with, with Todd's paralysis if they just had a seizure it might be a stroke mimic if they're postictal it might be a stroke mimic but remember that strokes themselves can actually also cause seizures just to complicate things but Todd's paralysis, one of the stroke mimics. There are certain drugs that can do it too, such as lithium, dilantin, and others. So you can check levels of these just to be sure. If your patient is on these medications, it's worth checking to make sure they're not toxic from these drugs. Both hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia can, make, can imitate a seizure. And this is quick and easy to check. Just do a quick AccuCheck. And various masses, such as tumors and bleeds, can do it. But you're going to see that because you're going to be getting a CT. In patients with a history of headaches, especially migraines, they can get complicated migraines, which can imitate a stroke. And one that gets all sorts of people all the time is Bell's palsy. And if you remember, Bell's palsy is a peripheral cranial nerve 7 disease. And so what you'll see is that, again, patients will come in with half their face paralyzed and think, oh my goodness, I'm having a stroke. I can't uh, you know, t turn the corner of my mouth up and they can't even move their foreheads. And now that is the thing. That's the thing that helps you distinguish this. Is this forehead flat or are they able to make wrinkles in their forehead? So remember how things are connected. Here's the forehead, here's the brain, and here's cranial nerve 7. Uh, and it crosses, and so your forehead over here, it's got input from this side of the brain as well as from the other side of the brain. So if you have uh, a stroke over here in this side of the brain, what's going to happen? Well, on this side of the forehead, it can still wrinkle itself by getting input from over here, and this side of the forehead can still wrinkle from getting input from this side. So with a stroke, meaning something happening in the brain, you could wrinkle your forehead still. Now what happens if you get Bell's palsy, if you get something wrong with the nerve? Well, then it happens in the nerve. 
And so what happens is, can you wrinkle this side of the forehead? No, because you got a problem here, so you're not getting any input from here or for here. But this side, you certainly can, because you're getting it from both sides. So a patient who cannot wrinkle their forehead probably has Bell's palsy. Other things that you could look for is when they close their eye. Well, first of all, they cannot close their eyelid all the way, but their, their eyeball tends to roll up as they're trying to close. That's called the Bell's phenomenon. And the other thing is, they better not have any symptoms in their arm or their leg, right? Because that's a stroke if it's in the face and the arm. If it's just in the face, they can't do their forehead, they got that Bell's phenomenon, then you probably have Bell's palsy. And finally, think conversion disorders can also do this. So if you have someone with perhaps a psych history or, or some symptoms that don't really make that much sense, consider conversion disorder as well. So make sure that you try to rule out all of these causes of the stroke mimics. And once you do, there's some other things that you want to get on your history. You also need to know when did these symptoms start. And you might think this is just a simple question to ask the family. When did you notice that there was something wrong? But that's not the question. The question isn't when did you notice. The question is when did it start? And the classic example of this is the patient who wakes up with symptoms. So when did the stroke start? Did it start at 7 a.m. when they got up and noticed that they have a stroke? We don't know. It could have happened at 3 a.m. when they were asleep. It could have happened at 11 p.m. when they were asleep. So the only no time that we do know is when did they go to bed and were they normal when they went to bed? So we don't want to ask the question, when did you notice the symptoms? Instead ask, when was the last time that you were without symptoms? Now let's move on to the physical exam. And of course, you're going to do a good neuro exam. And that good neuro exam should include an assessment of the patient's NIH stroke scale. And this is a scale that goes from 0 to 42 and it measures how severe the stroke is with 0 being no stroke, 1 to 4 being minor, and progressing through moderate all the way to, through a severe stroke. And you can see that they you measure all kinds of things like level of consciousness, best gaze, and the scores go from anywhere from 0 to 1 to 2 all the way to 0, 1 to 4. And there are a lot of things to remember on this exam. So you're not going to remember it, and so I suggest that you, you get some sort of memory aid. And I think a great one is the one that you find on the site, Academic Life in Emergency Medicine. And these are the Pausis Verbis cards, or in a few words, Pausis Verbis cards by Dr. Michelle Lin. If you have any in emergency medicine, or really medicine in general, you really have to check out our site, www academiclifeinem.com. These cards are incredible. The site's incredible, and she's incredible. Nothing I can say bad about her. It's just, in, just incredible. But you can print out this card and keep it in your pocket, and then score your patient on the severity of their uh, stroke on the NIH stroke scale. So that takes us quickly through a look at the history and physical that you want to do on patients who you think are presenting with a stroke. And remember, you want to hit the stroke mimics and uh, check out the Pauses Verbis cards. Okay, thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.